COVID-19 is the biggest news story that most of us have ever seen. And of all the institutions responsible for getting information out, the kind that can save lives, the World Health Organization may be the most vital. The WHO is a special agency of the United Nations, born of the recognition that since no single country can manage a global outbreak, an international body was needed that could ostensibly rise above the politics of national interests. In this pandemic, though, the WHO has fallen badly short of its mandate. Not only did it fail early on to properly vet the information coming out of China, the WHO amplified it. And that includes misinformation. Donald Trump says the WHO is China-centric. He's threatening to cut its U.S. funding. And even though Trump has good reason to search for a scapegoat, preferably one from overseas, in this case, he has a point. What if one of the most important news sources we have right now is compromised? The Listening Post's Nick Muirhead now on the World Health Organization. This is the headquarters of the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. It has 194 member states, operations in more than 150 locations, and its remit is in its name. As of now, there is no organization like it that has the ability to shape global news coverage. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. The World Health Organization has just declared that this is a pandemic. The WHO officially declared COVID-19 a pandemic. The World Health Organization has declared coronavirus a global pandemic. So when, at the onset of COVID-19, Chinese media observers noted a similarity between what the WHO was saying and official statements coming out of China, it was cause for alarm. Lawrence Gostin has worked closely with the WHO. Professor Gostin, on January 14th, the WHO repeated China's claim that there was no proof of human-to-human -human transmission of the coronavirus, a claim we now know to be false. Why do you think that happened? The WHO did um, uh, reiterate China's um, uh, reporting, um, but WHO had no independent means to assess um, the validity of Chinese reporting. Early on, China did not really allow it to have meaningful access to um, its territory uh, and to independently verify with, with journalists, scientists, and doctors on the ground. Dr. Tedros's strategy um, was to try to use smart diplomacy to coax China into greater transparency. And he had some success with that because later on, a WHO team, a small team, did go to China and they did a joint assessment report. WHO's reporting by virtue of its governance is highly dependent on um, every member country's ability uh, honesty and willingness to share data and issue notifications of epidemics within their uh, sort of country jurisdictions. Uh, its verification systems uh, can only be as good as the access they provide. The WHO has been here before. Back in 2002, Beijing suppressed information about another viral outbreak, SARS, and denied the WHO access for months. It was a different time in China. The Communist Party was experimenting with liberal reforms, temporarily loosening its censorship of the media. The Great Firewall of China was easier to circumvent, and social media was a far more open space. Chinese journalists were covering the outbreak, citizens were discussing it online, and the WHO had a much better window into the country than it does today. Prior to SARS, the WHO largely relied on, on its member states to report what was going on inside of them. So if they weren't cooperating, the WHO was essentially blind. But in the years just before SARS, the WHO um, enacted this enormous push to essentially monitor uh, media, especially through the internet. So they had a very good idea of what was going on inside through their private contact with scientists and also through monitoring Chinese message boards. So you can now look back uh, nearly 20 years and say that the early 2000s, including the SARS epidemic of 2002, was a sort of mini golden age of really quite tough investigative reporting by Chinese media, which then provided a great deal of benefit to outside foreign media 
and international organizations like the WHO. In a weird way, by loosening up on media, the Chinese government did itself a huge amount of favors at the time by helping to control the outbreak. It's critically uh, important to have robust um, and uh, reporting and free civil society and a free media um, for fighting a pandemic or any outbreak. Because when you have a free press, when you have whistleblowers, they can get out the word and sound an alarm about an epidemic um, far earlier than a go government can or will. And that was one of the critical deficiencies early on during COVID in China. After the WHO reportedly confronted China with its findings, Beijing came clean and the outbreak was contained. This time around, the criticism has been that the WHO acted too slowly, that out of fear of offending China, it declared COVID-19 a pandemic too late. But there's a story behind that as well. This is believed to be ground zero in the swine flu outbreak. H1N1, or swine flu, broke out in Mexico in 2009, and the WHO was quick to react. The World Health Organization is expected to declare the swine flu, or H1N1 virus, a pandemic this morning. The world's media hung on just about every word coming out of the WHO. However, when the outbreak tapered off with relatively low casualty rates, there was a backlash. There's growing global anger against the World Health Organization for reportedly making H1N1 pandemic bigger than it really was. So what was the criticism of WHO? Well, the criticism was, it seemed that every day, nearly, Margaret Chan, who was then the Director General of WHO, got up and announced a new alert level um, because the pandemic was spreading. And it was widely seen that the, that using that alert level um, really uh, uh, made the public fearful, panicked, and alarmed, um, but was unnecessary. Having declared a pandemic early, the WHO was criticized for a variety of things. It's claimed by a renowned German scientist that vaccine manufacturers pressured the World Health Organization into declaring a swine flu pandemic seeking to increase profits. And whether or not that was fair, I think you see the leadership becoming a bit more tentative, uh, looking at it and saying, wait, we did the thing that we were supposed to do and we got we got criticized for it. Um, we got run through the ringer in the media. And so maybe we should be more careful in the future. When the WHO declares a pandemic, not only does it risk inducing a panic, but it can also be devastating to the global economy as we are seeing today with COVID-19, which is why governments around the world will go to great lengths and in some cases great expense to control the information that gets out. China's contributions to the WHO pale in comparison to the US or the UK, but since the SARS outbreak of 2002, it has steadily increased that funding, which on the surface seems like a good thing, but money can also buy influence. It's not realized that actually tens of millions of dollars every year are coming from Beijing to the WHO and have been doing for quite some time. So I would say that when we've had WHO information going out to the world about what's happening in China, there is no doubt an element in the, in the WHO bureaucrats' minds that they have to keep their sponsors happy. The Chinese government is to be congratulated for the extraordinary measures it has taken to contain the outbreak the UN system uh, itself is, has become a place for geostrategic posturing, and uh, it's, this is happening across UN organizations. The WHO just happens to be uh, the latest one where uh, the old powers, Europe and North America, uh, is tussling with emerging powers like China for influence, uh, and particularly soft power influence um, over, over the world. Much of the criticism of WHO's handling of COVID-19 comes down to structural issues, primarily funding. In the journalism business, if a newspaper is reliant on ad revenues from the oil industry, its coverage of climate change is taken with a pinch of salt. And yet, when we tune in to the WHO, we see an impartial source of information. Even though the powers it is meant to hold to account get to determine in large part its access and its funding. Today I'm instructing my administration to halt 
funding of the World Health Organization while a review is conducted. It's not totally neutral. If you're seeing something coming from the WHO, it's something that its member states wanted to be released. It's something that a member state consented to be released. Um, so I think that if you really want to hold it accountable, um, you basically need to go to each individual member state and engage with journalism there, engage with criticism there to see the full picture. You sort of have to go beyond what, what states are telling us.